Good morning, everyone. I am Heather Herring, Education Manager of NRRA, and I want to warmly welcome you to the prequel of our summer webinar series, since it is just a few days before summer officially begins. This morning, we will delve into best practices for negotiating municipal contracts for waste, recycling, and composting part one. Next slide, please. Do you need professional credits? Um, you will receive 1.25 hours of credit for New Hampshire solid waste operators from New Hampshire DES for viewing this webinar. Webinars are recorded and made available for those who registered later. You can complete the survey at the end and connect with NRA and continue learning um, with webinars all summer long. You can visit our website at nrra.net, and by the end of June, we should have our new website available, and we'll have emails about that. Next slide, please. For our operators, we have 10 webinars throughout the summer to choose from and learn. You can register on our website there. Next slide. And for our educators, administrators, and community members, we will have 11 webinars to share. Although I list these on two different slides, all webinars are open to all. Next slide. I want to set the table for GoToWebinar. Um, you will not be able to be heard by the presenters or other participants on GoToWebinar. If you cannot hear the presenters, uh, click on the arrow next to the audio and select computer audio. If that does not work, try clicking on the phone call and follow those directions. And we hope that you ask questions and the presenters will answer them if time allows. Click on the question arrow next to the questions tab and keep their questions short. Next slide, please. And now I would like to introduce the presenters of best practices for negotiating municipal contracts for waste, recycling, and composting part one. Reagan Bissonette is the executive director of NRRA and Bonnie Bethune is the member services manager. Now I'm handing the presentation off to them. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. This is Reagan Bissonette. And I would like to start by thanking DES for hosting this webinar. So if it weren't for the pandemic, we would actually be holding a two and a half hour live training at the DES auditorium. But due to the circumstances, um, we agreed that it would make sense to divide this up into two hour and 15 minute webinars. So today is part one. And on Friday, we will be completing this presentation as part two. Um, I am, have been the executive director at NRRA for the past year. And before that, I practiced law at a law firm, um, doing a lot of contract negotiation, and then also worked for a land conservation organization as a staff attorney there. So, uh, like any good lawyer, I'm going to make a disclaimer. Uh, this presentation is not legal advice. And so it is very important that you consult with an attorney before you enter into any contracts. And we'll talk about that a bit more. Um, but I did want to share that it's something that I have a fair amount of experience with. Um, and Bonnie, you know, can you introduce yourself and tell everyone a bit about your uh, experience with contract negotiation? Yep. Uh Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Bonnie Bethune, and I've been working in the recycling industry since I graduated from UNH. Um, got involved there and ran an incinerator, a landfill, and helped design a recycling facility, and have been at NRRA for the last, um, since 2003. So have been here a while, and we're happy to be getting in touch with you about contracts and the hows and the whys of all of those. And I'll tell you all just briefly about NRRA, but I'll share one statistic as we get started. So NRRA is a recycling nonprofit. 
And in 2019, we helped communities recycle about 50,000 tons of material. And when we looked to see what of that material is under contract, about 30% of all the tonnage that we handle for our members is under contract. And the length of those contracts is anywhere from one year to six years. So we do have a lot of experience working day to day with contracts through our work at NRRA. So just to tell you a bit about the Northeast Resource Recovery Association, as I mentioned, we are a recycling nonprofit. We have over 400 members and our membership is primarily municipalities throughout the Northeast with a particular emphasis on New Hampshire Vermont and Massachusetts. And we were formed nearly 40 years ago when communities wanted to band together and share resources and information about how they could improve their recycling programs. And that really informs much of what we do today. So one of the two big things that we do as an organization is we help um, manage cooperative marketing and purchasing for our members. So we essentially enable communities to manage their own recycling programs. So that includes helping with single stream recycling, solid waste, glass, plastic, you name it. And what's very unusual about our work is that we're one of only a handful of nonprofits in the country that actually runs a recycling brokerage business. We actually help connect sellers of recyclables to the purchasers of those recyclables. Um, and, and that is where we get a lot of our experience with um, managing contracts for solid waste recycling and composting. Another big piece of what we do is education and technical assistance. So we routinely offer um, meetings, now currently calls, for members to talk about recycling markets. We offer facility tours so that municipalities can visit other recycling facilities. We typically have an annual conference, although that needed to get canceled this year due to the pandemic. And um, this webinar series that we're launching is actually part of what we're doing to take some of the education from our conference and turn it towards um, a new avenue for municipalities to continue to learn. Um, we also offer a considerable amount of technical assistance. Um, Bonnie provides a lot of that for municipalities. And then we also help educate the next generation about waste reduction and recycling school, through our school club programs. So we wanted to give you all a sense of where we're going today. So here's our agenda. And what we're going to cover today is general contracting principles that lay the foundation for talking about specific topics. So we're going to go through general contracting principles and we're going to talk a bit about topics that specifically relate to municipal solid waste and source separator recycling. And then on Friday, for the second part, we are going to take those contracting principles and apply them in depth to single and dual stream recycling and also to composting. And both of these webinars will be recorded so that if someone misses the first or misses the second, you can catch up later. Um, they're not really designed to be standalone presentations, so it makes sense to watch both of them. And we are going to leave time at the end for questions, and we'll also put in a break roughly halfway through to field any questions that come up as we go. So let's start with what might be kind of an obvious question, but why have a contract? Why have a contract for your municipal solid waste, for your recycling, for your composting? Well, certainly, if you're a municipality, and that is really the audience that we're primarily speaking to today, if you're a municipality, well, it's really helpful for planning your budget. If you know what to expect in terms of pricing, um, you could just rely on the spot market. And the spot market basically means you don't have a contract, but you can just pay typically a higher price to have your trash or your recycling or your composting taken care of. Another really important reason for um, having a contract is to clarify the responsibilities of each party, to be really clear what the expectations are. And then lastly, I wanted to talk a little bit about cost avoidance, because that really factors into why is it worthwhile to have a contract, um, and specifically ties into recycling and composting. So cost avoidance. Cost avoidance 
is the idea that, in this case, that recycling and composting can help you avoid the higher cost of municipal solid waste disposal. Now, I recognize that is not always true with single and dual stream recycling these days because the markets are down so much. But before we were in this down market, many communities were able to expect that it would be less expensive for them to recycle and compost than it would be for them to throw away their trash. And one thing we have seen is historically, the cost of landfilling and incineration have risen over time and we expect that they will continue to rise over time. So overall, recycling and composting is still a really valuable cost avoidance strategy for communities. Now, it's really important when you talk about cost avoidance to make sure that you're really comparing, uh, doing a full cost accounting. So for example, understanding if you think that it might be less expensive just to throw things away and not recycle at all, well, you have to take into account things like the cost of purchasing equipment or renting equipment, staffing costs, hauling costs, what is it gonna cost you to transport the material? Um, and, and Bonnie's gonna talk a bit later in more depth about how to make sure we're really doing a full apples to apples comparison when you're looking at your costs and considering your options. Now, one of the most fundamental things to start with when you are thinking about how to um, negotiate contracts is to know your market, to understand what is an appropriate market price for what you're considering paying for or getting paid for. So we had received some questions in advance of the webinar, and one of them was a wonderfully wide-ranging question, which said basically, how do you negotiate recyclables process that ensure transparency, fairness, and confidence in the supply chain. From, uh, from use through the manufacturer. And that's exactly what we're going to be talking about today. It really starts with knowing your market. So it's important to understand if you're being offered fair pricing so that you can effectively negotiate. And so an example I'll give is that a number of years ago, uh, NRRA had actually worked with a regional district in New Hampshire to negotiate their trash contract. And the initial pricing they were offered from the company, the vendor, was too high. And we were able to provide, based on market research that we had, we were able to show that really the cost should be lower. And ultimately, the community was able to save thousands of dollars. And that really comes down to knowing your current market pricing. So now I'm going to turn it over to Bonnie to talk a bit more about pricing and indexes and really how you can go ahead and get that market information that you need to effectively negotiate. Uh, pricing and indexes. It's really important to understand the current market, market pricing and trends. If you have no point of reference when you get a, a RFP or a bid, uh, you really can't know um, how to compare, again, apples to apples, but what is that going to do over time? So you want to look back at what is the indexes that are being proposed, um, and we have many indexes in the recycling community. Uh, pulp and paper index is for fibers that comes out monthly and is a basis for many of the contracts and how they determine the value of cardboard, mixed paper, sorted office paper, um, revenue-wise or potentially even cost-wise. And that comes out on the fifth business day of every month and anybody in the recycling industry is very interested in what the pulp and paper index is or the PPI as you will hear it. Um, there are also other resources that uh, recyclingmarkets.net, um, many of the metals, scrap metal, steel cans, go by the American Metals Market, AMM. And um, we're constantly looking as well as if, if there's any fuel surcharges, you would be looking at indexes for that. So all of those things will um, determine what is that bottom line that you will be spending um, or getting for your material. and 
as you know, the prices are fluctuating for all kinds of reasons, not only the um, China soared as we started into all of this over the last couple of years, but now with the pandemic. So it's been very interesting to watch how all of that adjusts. And if we go into um, monthly marking, monthly pricing guide, and this is what we want you to see here, is if you look at municipal solid waste, and the um, cost is between 70 and 120 a ton, and then you look at if you source separate out your materials up to the high right now is, of course, the plastic HDP natural. Under normal circumstances, it probably would have been aluminum cans, but aluminum cans pricing is down and is just starting to eke up. Next valuable, valuable would be the sorted office paper. Uh, cardboard is looking pretty good right now. Hopefully that holds. Newsprint is still very valuable in uh, for insulators for making making insulation. And then your HDPE colored, your Tide bottles, that sort of thing. Um, plastics, the one through seven mix, and then down to steel cans, and then mixed paper is um, is a challenge, and it has been for the last year or so, and is starting to see a little bit more value. And then we're looking at um, our glass, and our glass program um, right now is in the 35 to 40 range uh, going into our host sites. So you want to know what is everything else doing in order to determine what your contract is showing. Uh, one of the major benefits of NRA membership is access to this monthly pricing guide. Um, and it's based on, on actual values that we get from our vendors each month. And we give a range to, to just to give a guideline. And it's real pricing for this region, not hypothetical pricing. When we start talking about RFPs, uh, when do you have to use an RFP? Um, communities set up a monetary amount on when to put out an RFP. And a lot of the ones that we had looked at, anything over 10,000 would have to go out to bid. Um, but they're not all created equal. Uh, we have handouts that show a simple one pager. And then we have uh, RFPs that are, are quite extensive and quite long. The main information you want on your RFP is it's historical information. What did you have? Let's, let's talk about a MSW um, RFP. What did you have the year before? How many tons? What was your equipment? Being incredibly specific so that, so that when you get those bids back, you are getting the same information from your vendors. Again, we're going to talk about um, apples to apples. How do you compare RFP responses? Um, drill down the cost to the revenue per ton or the cost per ton in the case of MSW. What is the actual bottom line? And that will give you your apples to apples comparison. It's not always easy. Um, a lot of the bids that come in will be presented in a very different way. So it really takes some analysis to get to that. We had um, one large community that was doing single stream, and they had very different responses for their RFPs. Some included equipment. Some did not include equipment. Some included um, an option of delivered price only, and others did not. So it was, it was, it's a challenge, but it's, um, you've got to get to that bottom line. An additional um, RFP resource that we found is Contracting 101. Uh, the New Hampshire Municipal Association puts out, and we've given you that link there. And that discussed the public bidding process in New Hampshire, and it, it caps, capsula, capitalizes, that's, I think that's the right word, um, RFPs and, and a little bit more information about that. So at this point, we wanted to take a brief pause and see if anyone had any initial questions about the RFP process specifically or 
cost avoidance, um, just any anything that we've covered initially. If you have any questions, feel free to send those over right now. All right, well, we're not seeing any initial questions coming through, so we'll go ahead and keep moving. And like I said, we'll have time at the end as we jump more into the meat of some of this. So one of our recommendations, and I'd like to note some of these things may come across as a bit obvious, but we have seen so many things go wrong <laughs> when you don't follow some of these more basic recommendations that we really think they're worth pointing out. Um, so one of our first recommendations is to make sure that you are very clear about defining what materials are subject to your contract. And as I said, it, this may seem obvious, but what may seem obvious to the municipality or what may seem obvious to the vendor might not always be the case. And so it's always the best practice to be as clear as possible. So for example, municipal solid waste. Well, we had a situation come up just the other day where a municipality had a, um, a doctor's office drop off some medical waste into their MSW. And so the question becomes, well, is that okay? Is that, uh, is that, is that municipal solid waste? Is that something that can still be sent off to the landfill that that municipality sends its waste to? Um, it, it'd be helpful to be very clear on that in your contract. Another, another example is um, C&D material. You know, do you want to be clear that that includes brick, block? Should it include sheetrock, shingles, lumber? I mean, what exactly is allowed as construction and demolition debris? And what is not allowed? Because we run into the situation where we have communities who keep sending what they think is uh, clean lumber <laughs> to their C&D vendor, and they keep getting contamination fees charged because they're um, not, they're not, they're not sending what the vendor thinks they're receiving. And uh, a last example here related to recyclables, well, again, it's, it's very important to be clear what is and is not allowed. And this certainly becomes even more relevant when you're talking about uh, single and dual stream recycling, but even with source separated recycling, I mean, plastics. Plastics is a great example. You know, can you take black plastics? Can you take, uh, you know, no, number four plastics? Um, we have, Bonnie will talk a little bit later, we have a vendor who takes number one through seven plastic bailed, and we had quite a long conversation determining exactly what plastics they really want and accept and what they're doing with that material. And then length of contract. So, when it comes to the length of your contract, as we said at NRRA, we have contracts that go from one year to six years. I know of a municipality that has a 10 year contract that is coming due soon. So as a general rule, we do recommend a longer term contract for your municipal solid waste. And that's because we do see that those prices continue to steadily rise over time. So, to ensure some stability for your budget, um, we do recommend you go ahead and you lock in a rate for a longer period of time with the understanding that you want to make sure you're getting a good price. So one example that came up recently is that we have a municipality, this is in southwestern New Hampshire, and their contract is coming up due in September of this year. And their tipping fee is going up from $67.50 up to $80 a ton. And for that particular community, for their region, and for their needs, that price change is an accurate reflection of what's appropriate for the market now for them. Now also, when you think about the length of contract for recycling, right now we are actually recommending shorter term recycling contracts. And that's because we're in such a period of market uncertainty, the prices are down overall, and it's still changing rapidly. But if you are going to 
enter into a longer recycling contract, we would absolutely encourage you to tie that to an index or a very clear cost and revenue sharing calculation. Um, you know, Bonnie talked a bit about indexes that are available and when we talk about dual and single stream recycling on Friday, we'll get into cost and revenue sharing calculations as well. So one rather dramatic example is that we have a municipality that we work with who had a single stream contract. It was a three-year contract and they had very favorable terms at the time, which was $57.50 per ton for managing their recyclables. And this included free equipment. Um, you know, they were not having to purchase or rent the containers that were being used. Well, now that the market has changed, the vendor had come back with a dramatically higher price, $145 a ton. Um, part of that was factoring in that the vendor no longer wanted to provide equipment without charging a fee. So again, because of the variability we're seeing with recycling markets right now, we're recommending shorter term contracts. Now, in terms of renewing contracts, we're a real fan of having contracts renew automatically for additional terms unless one party opts out. And hey, maybe it's because we deal with a lot of contracts at NRMB, but it is very time consuming to negotiate new contracts frequently. So if you are happy with the terms you have and you can, for example, have a three year contract with two more uh, optional renewal periods. And if everyone is happy, you can just let the contract continue without doing additional work. That saves you time and energy. Um, you certainly want to make sure you have a term in there that will let you get out if you want to opt out. But it's nice to give yourself the ability to ride out and continue a contract that's working well for both parties without having to keep renegotiating. Um, the terms. Now, of course, then the question is termination. Well, you want to make sure you can get out of your contract, uh, especially if the other party has the right to get out. So let's be honest, you, we should expect things to go wrong when we enter into contracts. Um, you know, we should hope for the best, but we should plan for the worst. And we should expect that one party or another might have a change of heart regarding, con regarding the, the terms of the contract. So one example that came up recently in Massachusetts was that there was a single and dual stream contract for communities that made it very clear that the materials recovery facility, the facility that processed that single and dual stream recycling, the facility had very, very clear right to terminate the contract if minimum tonnages were not met. But there was no clear right in that contract for municipalities to terminate the contract upon certain terms. So that's just a red flag to watch for because you really want to think through if something goes wrong, how are you going to get out? Now here is a sample mutual termination clause. So this is a clause that we have used. Uh, this is a clause we've seen in other agreements and it's pretty straightforward. What it says is that either party with or without cause upon 90 days of written notice may elect to terminate the, terminate the agreement without further liability provided the such terminating party shall continue to pay all fees and fulfill all of its obligations through the effective date of such termination so i'm going to break down what that covers to be clear so either party so that means that both parties to the contract get the option may with or without cause. So whether you have a good reason or not, you have the right to get out of this contract with 90 days prior notice. And it makes it clear that once you terminate this agreement, there's no further liability for either party. You know, either, both parties can leave the agreement after 90 days without any further responsibilities except that leading up to that 90 day period, everyone still has to follow their obligations and they still have to you know, pay money that is due. Um, and that makes sense because you don't want someone to be able to terminate an agreement 
and the very next day, um, all bets are off. This basically gives you a 90 day period to make other plans and finish up the current terms of the contract. So here's another one. What happens if things go wrong? So what could possibly go wrong in 2020, right? Um, we encourage everyone to make sure that you carefully review your force majeure provision. So every contract should have a force majeure provision. Why? Because this is a provision that tells you what happens when things go very, very wrong, unexpectedly wrong. So here's an example, and this is a real example. This actually comes from NRRA's hotel contract for our conference. So when the pandemic hit and we had to look at what to do about our two-day conference that was supposed to be held in Manchester in May, that was going to have, you know, four to 500 people showing up and we had already put down a deposit, we wanted to look at our contract and see what would happen due to the pandemic because our contract also had a very specific termination clause that indicated that if we terminated the contract within a certain period of time of the conference date, we were going to have to pay quite a bit in fees. The hotel actually wanted to charge us about $30,000 in termination fees when we initially started this conversation. So here is the provision we had. And my question for you all is, does the following cover a pandemic? So the provision is no damages shall be due for a failure of performance due to act of God, acts of God, war, government regulation, disaster, strikes, any one of which may make performance impossible. And that's really the key part of a force majeure provision. It is explaining if some terrible thing goes wrong that makes it impossible for one of the parties or both of the parties to meet their duties, uh, can you get out? That, that's what this provision is for. And what I'd like to do is have you all take a look at this provision and decide, do you think this covers a pandemic? And I'm going to put up a poll in a moment so that everyone can weigh in on this and we'll see what people think. So if you had this in your contract, do you think you'd be able to get out due to the pandemic? So here is your poll. If you could please select yes, no, or I've also given you a who knows option <laughs> that you can complete. All right, and I see that the numbers are coming in. And we're still collecting some responses. I see 58% of people have voted. So if you haven't voted, now is your chance. And I'll close the poll in a minute and I will share with you all the results of what we're seeing. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and close this. And what we find is, Here we are. So you should be able to see here that a little more than half of you think that this provision does cover the pandemic. About a third think no. And about 17% fall into the situation I was faced with, which is who the heck knows. And I'll tell you that ultimately, we had a whole back and forth with the hotel and here's how it, here's how it turned out. The government regulation was actually the key provision here. The question was whether or not there was a sufficient government regulation to allow us to uh, get out of this contract. And ultimately, ultimately because of the governor's stay at home orders and prohibition on allowing groups of, you know, at one time it was 50 or more people to gather, Ultimately, we were able to get out of the contract under that government regulation piece. But this example is to share with you that in the future, I would encourage you, and I'm sure that just about everyone will do this, make sure you include epidemic or pandemic in your force majeure provision. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Bonnie to talk about some special considerations for contract negotiations. 
Um, we found that there are creative communities out there that have um, had special circumstances um, that they would either put right into their RFP or into their contract and with the thought that it can't hurt to ask. Um, one, this one community I'm referencing is a busy uh, Lakes Region community and they are, they have a very busy facility that increases exponentially during the summer. So part of their solid waste contract is they are requiring pick up within three hours of calling the, the um, entity that picks up their waste. If that container is not picked up or swapped out in three hours, then the haul fee for that container is waived. And this is part of their contract. They had a special need and they made the special request and that request was honored. So again, if you have something that's a little bit off, don't hesitate to ask in the beginning and set that up and that is a great benefit, particularly during um, the busy, again, a busy seasonal community. So the exact word, wording is contract must remove material from site within three hours of notification during normal business hours, Monday through Saturday. If notified after 1 p.m., material will be removed before opening of next business day at 7.30 a.m. If contractor fails to comply with a three hour removal time, three times in a quarter, then any hauls over the three hours limit will be at no charge. Such failure to comply shall constitute breach of contract and may result in termination of the contract at the owner's option. Um, and then they, they actually have waived away fuel, environmental, or any other charges beyond the haul fee which um, we know in our own contracts at NRRA that the fuel surcharges can add up to be quite a bit and they are oftentimes variable. So you want to be aware of whether those are included or not and potentially ask them to go away. Hey Bonnie, this is Reagan. Can I chime in here? I just want to point out that these are really great terms. <laughs> this is this is not something that we have seen a lot of examples of, but we were so impressed that a municipality was able to negotiate the, these provisions that we wanted to share them with everyone because there's no harm in asking. The worst thing you can do is ask and get turned down. And I mean, I think Bonnie, you also shared that we're pretty sure the vendor is regretting agreeing to the first one because there have been a number of situations where the haul fee had to be waived due to this provision. And and this is particularly a, the time that we're in right now is yeah, there's more MSW right now in a lot of our facilities because they aren't still recycling temporarily and when you get to a busy Saturday and you're halfway through and you've got 300 more people coming along, these things have to happen rather rapidly. So it's, um, yes, this community is the envy of all around them, for sure. Understanding the end markets, we referred to this a while back, um, but part of it is knowing where your material is going and what happens to it there. I have a great example. I just talked with one of our communities and they knew who hauled their glass to a host site, but they didn't know where that host site was. And this was a new operator. So we're going to get back to him and we're going to let him know the whole scoop. Um, but where is your material going? Why? You want to be sure that you're being, your community is being environmentally responsible. You want to know the end market. You want to know where that material is going, what is it being made into, and if it's exported, you should know that. If it goes to a mill in, in New England or just outside of New England, and I think that mill direct information is important as well so that we understand where that material is going. And you'll be able to tell your residents and instill in them a confidence and an ownership when you can tell them that. One of our examples is one of our plastics vendors. 
we sat down for about an hour and talked about what happens to that material because we have a lot of anxiousness about plastics going to market but a good portion of it being thrown away. So the example is our, our one through seven market and just as a quick um, breakdown, the number one in the one through seven mix is sold to manufacturers for carpet and clothing. The number two natural is pelletized and made right into plastic lumber at this site and made into high-end plastic furniture. The number two mixed color, again, your tie bottles, is made into black drainage pipes, cartwheels, etc. The three through seven, which is mainly fives and sevens, I challenge anybody to find a three um, vinyl container out there at this point. But the remaining fives through sevens go to Canada where they capture the number five polypropylene and some of the sevens. So a good portion of that one through seven mix is being captured. There's a, a spec that our operators have to meet for the one through seven mix. Um, but again, where is it going? What's happening to it? What is the end result of all of the labor that staff is putting into? And being assured that yes, a, a certain portion will be landfilled, but the majority of that material is going into other products. And that's just not for plastics, but, but knowing where all of your material goes. It, if it's going to an incinerator, for example, when we incinerate, there's also landfilling of the ash that comes out of the end. And um, that's important to know that you're not just incinerating, you're also landfilling. So understand your impact, understand where that material is going. Legal review, I feel like I'm stepping into Reagan's shoes. Um, ensure your, your town attorney has experience in reviewing solid waste contracts, or I mean it could be very well a town administrator that has come in and has experience with these contracts. It doesn't necessarily, you know, you certainly want your attorney's approval but uh, there's all kinds of talent out there in knowing these contracts. Um, why a legal review? I, we believe that waste and recycling and composting contracts are very unique and unlike other contracts, um, that's important. You know what, Bonnie? Informal, I wanna, yeah. Oh, I just mm -hmm. wanted to Absolutely. Add, another piece is, and we, it's really important for municipalities to also for the for the facility staff or at least the facility manager to be able to read and understand the contract so this is where there can be a disconnect where if you've got an attorney reviewing your contract and you think oh i'm set we've gotten the legal advice we need but the fact is it doesn't matter how experienced your attorney is no one is experienced as to what specifically your municipality needs aside from your own transfer station uh, manager and staff. So, you know, it's fine and good to make sure that you have a decent force majeure provision to make sure that you've got a good um, contract term and renewal terms, but you also need to make sure, as we talked about earlier, some of the very basic things that almost seem so basic that you shouldn't have to pay attention to them, but your operators are going to know um, you know exactly what material do we want to um, accept under uh, you know for construction and demolition debris and make sure that your vendor is going to take what you think they'll take um, and, and also information about you know when is the facility going to be open and available for haulers to come in and pick up material those are the types of nuances that it's really important to make sure that in addition to that legal review you also have someone actually knowledgeable on staff who can understand that contract and ensure that it has the right practical information in it. And I think I would add to that, that we're seeing a lot of um, change in operators um, via retirement or um, at this point, medical issues that they can't be amongst other people. So when we have a new operator come on and NRRA has a contract with that community, we pass on to them the, the contract itself 
and what it entails and what commodities there are that we are dealing with, not only with a contract, but through our organization. And that gets them up to speed. But I think you're right, Reagan. and I think a lot of times the, the facility operators may not even be aware there's a contract for that material. They're doing what they do and they're very busy every day, but they may not understand that they are under contract with a certain um, company and again, where is it going, so on and so forth. So we're hopeful that there'll be more of that communication so that everybody understands what's going on. So that leads into inform elected officials. Um, our recommendation is present the status of programs to elected officials or municipal manager one or two times a year, and, and that follows through with what we were talking about, in, including detail, invite the public, make available in writing, um, keeping everybody up to speed on that uh, contract. Um, it's important for decision makers to be informed how programs work and any expected or unexpected changes. Um, We've been often invited to go in and talk about markets in particular to help um, administrators. In fact, we went, Megan and I went before a, a council and we were, we were supposed to talk for 15 minutes about markets so that they could understand, particularly in the single stream venue, what is happening out there? Why are single stream co costs going up so much? Um, what is the market telling us? And, the history of the market. We ended up talking for nearly an hour to that council um, and they had excellent questions. I was, I was actually impressed with their scope of knowledge and their ability to ask the questions so that they could base their new contract um, on current information. Um, also letting them know what resources are available out there as their contract progresses. So again, important to have all the decision makers involved. And in this case, it wasn't just the council, it was the uh, public works director was present, the, um, the operator of the facility was present. There were two uh, state reps who lived in the community who were present. And so it really was a valuable one hour conversation about not only the contract, but what's happened prior in the markets and what's happening, what do we anticipate happening going forward. So um, I think we learned as much as they did in that, that hour session. And another thing that was nice was that the community also, they recorded that session. And so it was available, I think it was live streamed actually, and then recorded. So it was available even for residents who weren't able to attend they could reference that information later. Um, and so, you know, we say make it available in writing. Well, even better, I guess, if you could make it available in video afterwards, just again, so you can share that information widely so that residents and decision makers can be informed. So we are to our end for questions, and we do have some questions that have come in that we'll start going through. I did want to remind everyone that we do have the questions um, feature so for submitting questions, so please do send those to us. I'm going to go ahead and read off a few questions by that we've had come through. So a little after we had stopped for our first pause for questions, we had a question come through, Bonnie. How do we have a standard calculation for overhead, like, you know, staff time, you know, labor hours. How can communities make sure that they're doing that full cost accounting? Is that something you could address, Bonnie? Um, a few years ago, we actually did a workshop on this at our conference, and I believe it was the town of Swansea had come up with a full cost accounting um, spreadsheet that uh, showed them every nuance of hall, fuel surcharge, um, staff time, even um, bailing, bailer cost and amortizing that over time. And it was quite extensive and we shared that a lot with a number of communities. But I think it is something that is not done enough. Uh, full cost accounting, we know as, as a group that it costs to recycle. There is no doubt about it. But how does that compare 
with the cost of of municipal solid waste. We municipal solid waste is fairly straightforward. You have your tipping fee, you have your hauling fee, you may have your rental of containers, you may be delivering your own material to market or to the to the MSW site. Um, you may have your own equipment. Then you've got insurance. You've got um, maintenance of your your equipment, and then you've got your operator who's going to use his time or her, her time. And so that that can be looked at and and come down to what is the cost full cost per ton for your MSW. It's a lot more complicated when you get into the recycling end of it when you do have to look at all of those factors of operator, staff, uh, continuing ed, all of that. But it's absolutely, I, I think that's a tool that we need and that we would we would, would use to share with other communities because those are big decisions. I'm actually working with a community that has no recycling facility. They have been uh, they've been doing curbside, and it became so expensive for curbside single stream that they stopped the program. Now their residents have to go to a neighboring town, and there's not a lot of recycling going on because of the ways to go. So they they would really benefit in looking at other people's full cost accounting as to what other facilities have. So yes, we we have we have a piece of paper that says how to do it, but I think that is a tool that we should have um, updated and available to our members. Thanks, Bonnie. And another question that came through is what tips do we have for multi-town contract negotiation and how to develop partnerships to share costs and work collaboratively to manage solid waste? So this is an interesting one because although we certainly have people on this webinar who are not from New Hampshire, since DES is hosting this webinar, we are keeping our focus mainly on New Hampshire. And here in New Hampshire, solid waste districts are pretty rare. So one example is BCEP and out in China, uh, Bonnie, are they based in Epsom? I should know this. Are they in Epsom or Chichester? In, in Pittsfield, actually. Oh, geez, Pittsfield. So anyway, <laughs> four different communities, and they have a solid waste district. So four communities share one transfer station. But that's pretty unusual here in New Hampshire. In, uh, in Vermont, on the other hand, you see many solid waste districts. And actually, in Vermont, you'll see that solid waste districts are often providing some of the same services that NRRA is providing for municipalities in New Hampshire. So although this is not intended to be a sales pitch, the fact is that since in New Hampshire we don't have many solid waste districts, that is part of the reason why NRRA was founded here in New Hampshire was to provide that type of um, you know, contract negotiation and collaborative partnership advice. Um, so I do know that um, Lisa Stevens from BCEP has spoken before about how their solid waste district operates, um, but I'm not sure that I have anything really in addition to add to specific tips for um, multi-town negotiation because we honestly just don't see a lot of that. Although, Bonnie, we do have some communities, you know, two communities will share a transfer station or perhaps more accurate to describe that one community will bring its waste and recycling to another community as part of a partnership. Could you talk a bit more about that? There's a there's quite a bit of that going on. Um, back in the 80s, New Hampshire um, DES said that all towns have to be part of a solid waste district. Um, it was it was a collaborative way of getting everybody up started into building facilities, getting recycling going, and uh, those districts that are left now are part of that. Um, we have some two town districts, uh, Sunapee, Springfield, um, Hillsboro, Deering, Windsor is three towns that are still working together. And it's a great model. I mean, it's basically the basis of what NRRA started with four towns getting together 
to recycle their cardboard and get better pricing because of volume. So it's 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 a good model, and and yes, it's it's um again in the exception rather than the rule. The there's a lot of mutual aid going out there, and we always think of mutual aid as fire departments. Um, but there's a lot going on with the public works department as well as the um, recycling centers. During, during some changes in one of the towns next to me, they had um, done away with their single stream recycling for the time being, but they really wanted to pull their cardboard out and get that out of the MSW uh, compactor, because as you know, it takes up a lot of room. And they asked a neighboring town who had a baler if they would be willing to take their cardboard and on a begun. There are doing mutual aid amongst recycling centers. So I think I think those things are probably going to happen maybe a little bit more um, just to get through this pandemic. But I, I think it's also something that should be looked at a little bit more as far as collaborative working together. Um, an example of what NRA does is some of these smaller towns, um, they don't produce enough material to fill a full tractor trailer load, say, of plastics or cardboard. And oftentimes we do two stops so that we can we can keep the material moving. So that's a, a little microcosm of, of other things that can be done collaboratively to make things go better. Mm -hmm. Now we've got another question that asks, how do municipalities get verification about end markets and how materials are used? So, you know, how is it that a municipality is actually supposed to confirm that information? And that may be something that's in the contract, um, being a full disclosure that can happen and, and sometimes isn't always as clear because I know when communities are filling out their, their DES um, annual report, their cardboard may have gone to three or four different vendors. So it's not as simple as where's your plastic go and what happens to it. It's really understanding what is your end market. And if you're in a contract situation, then that would be a great time to ask where is the end use. Again, this is another thing that we don't focus on enough. Um, we've been trying in our spreadsheet, in our spec sheets that we give out to include that. And, you know, tires is made into crumb rubber, a certain percentage of it, and a certain percentage is this. And, and it's something that, that we have, um, as, as a cooperative organization, we are really looking at those and being much more transparent as to what's happening with that material. So it's, it's really just asking the question. And it's hard because we have discussed this quite a bit, Bonnie, you and I. We've talked about how can we give, at least for the members that work with us, how can we give more transparency about where material goes? And in some cases, we can do that pretty easily. For example, we can tell communities that are um, sending their glass bottles and jars through NRRA that all of that material is going up to a vendor in Canada who is processing the glass, and then it comes back to the United States and is made into fiberglass insulation. But that's when we're, you're working directly with a vendor. So sometimes we and other municipalities, you might be working with a broker who has several different buyers. And so in that case, it's more difficult. We've run into this when we've tried to figure out, okay, well, where is, where is our mixed paper going? Well, that's a tough one. A lot of mixed paper is getting exported. We happen to know that there are companies in India who really like um, the quality of a lot of the mixed paper that comes from communities that are source separating in New Hampshire. But I, it'd be harder for us to tell you exactly where in India it's going. So this is a tough one, and um, the best you can do is, as Bonnie said, ask questions and really try and drill down into um, as much clarity as possible. And, and to some degree, you just yeah, well, have to, you know, at some point you have to have a level of trust too. I mean, just trust a trusting relationship with a vendor who is going to tell you the truth. And and to add on to that. When you're looking at, at any commodity, um, particularly single stream, be, have it very clear what is the average outgrowth, the material that can't be recycled, 
um, that is going to be thrown away. And understanding that is a dual benefit. Um, if if there's a certain product that is being included in the single stream at the curbside that shouldn't be, then that communication between the vendor and the community is incredibly important um, so that that material can be kept out for one thing, so there's less outgrowth on the other end. It's not just up to the single stream facility, it's up to the community that's putting that material in. A great example of that is Gosstown, New Hampshire did a campaign of using sandwich boards. And one week the sandwich board would say no um, rubber hoses in single stream. And they would put these around town at various places because you all know when we see a sign two, three times, we don't see it anymore. So that was very effective in cleaning up the stream going into the facility to be uh, recycled. And we also all know that it's not, mostly it's not people's, they're not trying to throw in a program, they just want to recycle everything. So it, most of it comes from a very good place. But education is nonstop when it comes to not only single stream recycling, but material coming in that's being source separated. And I, I, I can't emphasize that enough. And I think in the long run, if, if residents know that a certain bottle is not going to be recycled, maybe, maybe in my, my world, my half, glass half full world, that they wouldn't buy that, that item again if they can't recycle it at their facility. So. Now, Bonnie, we actually have had two more questions come in related to the plastics information you were sharing. So I'm going to jump to one of those. So someone asked, you noted that one recycler was sending three through seven plastics to Canada. I recently read that companies in Canada generally take out the most valuable plastics and then ship the remainder to Indonesia, et cetera. Can this be prevented? So this is That's an good, interesting yeah. question. Yeah, um, I was just going to start by saying that one thing about plastics that are less valuable is there are it's more expensive to process material domestically and in Canada than it is to process in countries that have a cheaper labor force. It's just a uh, a, a market reality. And so it is not uncommon to have more valuable material like those number one and two plastics, number five plastics to get processed domestically or perhaps, you know, in, in Canada. And then for lower value materials such as plastic and plastic, of course, is what has gotten the most news attention recently for it then to get shipped to a country that has a lower cost of labor like Indonesia. Now, simply sending the material to a country where it's less expensive to process in itself is not a bad thing. I think that the concerns that people have come up really when you're talking about poor working conditions. It's one thing to have the labor cost be less. It's another thing if people are being exposed to sort of hazardous work conditions. and it is difficult to paint with a broad brush and to say that everyone working in a lower cost labor country is working under poor conditions. Um, although I do know that that certainly happens. Um, Bonnie, kind of what's your take on this? Um, back to the three through sevens. And it does relate to contracts because you do have to understand your market. Um, the three, let's look at the three, four, five, six, seven. So threes, there are very few vinyls out there in the, in the recycling stream. Fours are your, your LDPEs and they probably are the lowest value of the whole three through seven. Um, fives are the highest value of the three through seven. The, the polypropylenes, we're talking full width containers, that sort of thing. Number six, I don't think there's any doubt, those are probably landfills. Um, polystyrene is, is probably the most difficult plastic to capture and recycle. Sevens, if you think about a orange juice 
plastic a plastic container that has orange juice in it. It's a number seven. It's mostly a number two, but it has a vinyl liner in it due to the acidity of the orange juice. So they couldn't say it's a number two, so they call it a number seven. It sort of goes into that miscellaneous category. So the vendors would know which one of those number sevens actually they could process in whatever they do. So this this question is great. It's it's going to make me go back to my vendor and ask that what's downstream from Canada, if any. Mm -hmm. And then the other question that came through regarding plastics was, is the list of what plastics are used for posted anywhere? I would love to share that info with residents. So that must, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing this is referring to that list, Bonnie, you said of sort of what happens to our one through seven mix. Yeah, um, we, we have quite a bit of this information to share. And I really appreciate these more technical questions. Um, and we have a two page, one through seven, where does it go um, flyer that we can share? Absolutely. And what I'll add is that um, because this question was asked by an NRRA member, I do believe we have shared that before on our email listserv. Um, and also, we will be launching a new website for NRRA next week, and it will make it much easier to find information like this. Right now, even if we put it on our current website, you probably have some trouble finding it. Um, but yes, mm -hmm. that is something that we can um, make available to share with folks after the presentation. And then let's see, we had one other question asking, is AVRRDD my only choice up here in COAS? So they're referring to Androscoggin, uh, Berlin up at the landfill. I'm not sure, I'm not sure we have enough information to answer the question. What I would say is uh, this question, if it's coming through an NRRA member, maybe reach out to Bonnie afterwards and we can discuss that a bit more offline. Absolutely. And then we have another question coming in. This is someone saying, I love the educational tip about sandwich boards. I'm the new recycling coordinator for West Hartford, Connecticut. Do you have a list of other education tools that you have found effective? And I'm sure the vendors do as well. Um, so yes, we have some that we can share. And oftentimes it's connecting the dots community to community um, so that they can really get into the meat of the matter. Um, and also there's so much on, you know, who are you working with now and is there anything on the website that's available? to um, duplicate or or to mimic that way. So yes, we can help with that as well. And I'll also add, I don't believe we're going to have this section on our new website right when it launches, but we have actually been talking about wanting to have a designated place on our new website where we will have resources that are geared to be used by operators to then share directly with their members. So much of our website is going to be geared towards information for operators, but we also want to ensure that in the future, we're going to be building a section exactly for this, which is resources that operators can then share with residents. I will add that the recycling partnership has um, so a social media toolkit where you can take social media posts that they have prepared and customize them for your use and reuse them. So that's another uh, resource that I would um, refer to as well. And we have included um, Contracting 101 from the New Hampshire Municipal Association. That's part of this webinar as well, right? Pardon? Um, is that a document that's available to attendees Yes, right. That, the recycling yes. partnership. Yep, it's it's available to anyone who wants okay. to go to the recycling partnerships website. They have educational materials that they have designed that are available for anyone across the country 
to use. I think they also have a sign builder. You can build your own signs using their designs and customize it. And then it's designed to just print out on your, your own color printer. So they have some good resources for that. And another thing that if, if someone is looking to go into a contract, we, I hate to put it this way, but we use our operators a lot. So if there's an operator that we feel has been very um, astute at negotiating contracts, then we would connect the dots. Um, either it's something we could provide a, a contract for, or we would have operators talk to other operators about um, what they've learned, what pitfalls to avoid, and yeah, again, mutual aid, and we are a cooperative, so there's a lot of of um, back and forth and sharing of information that, again, we could connect the dots as well. All right, and this is actually good timing because I believe we've gotten through all the questions that came through, and want to just be mindful of time. So please do join us on Friday. So as a preview of what we're going to talk about Friday, we're going to start with, uh, we're not going to be rehashing any of the same information, but we're going to take the foundation, a lot of the general contract negotiation principles that we talked about, and then we're going to specifically apply them to single and dual stream recycling and composting. So for example, we're going to go into quite a bit of detail about both national and Northeast market data that we have for single and dual stream recycling. We're going to be talking about specifically who offers composting services in New Hampshire and giving some examples of what those types of um, relationships look like. So if you haven't already registered for the second webinar, we hope you will. And as a reminder, all of these webinars are recorded. So even if you can't actually attend live on Friday, you're welcome to sign up and then afterwards you'll get a copy of it. And now I will hand this off to Heather to wrap us up. Uh, thank you, Reagan and Bonnie, for such an informative presentation about contracts. We learned about, you know, when you're reviewing your contracts and make sure you're comparing apples to apples, the impact of where the material goes, um, informing your elective officials and uh, make sure you have a full cost accounting of your contract. I want to thank the sponsor for this prequel to our summer webinar series, the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services, and remind everyone that a survey will launch immediately after this webinar. It will also appear in your email inbox. Um, we welcome feedback. Next slide, please. Next week is the official begin of the summer webinar series, and we'll be having our first will be on Recycling Markets Update with Chaz Miller on Wednesday at 9 to 10 a.m. on June 24th, and then optimizing our recycling education and outreach efforts with Aaron Victor on Friday from noon to 1. Um, please register and join us. Thanks and happy summer from NRRA.